Hello, everyone, and welcome. It is Wednesday, the 23rd of February, and we are here for the Knowledge Bolide Hangout, sponsored by Topper Spin Meteorites. And today we're going to be discussing irons in detail. This is irons part two. There's a bunch of classes we're going to be covering. I'll put them on the screen. Really good information, really cool stuff. So the URL is at the top there, meteorites.ucla.edu. And they also have a YouTube channel. And for once, I don't feel bad. We have about 4,400 subscribers and they only have 123. So let's beef them up a little bit. Go out to the UCLA Meteorite Collection YouTube page and give them a subscription and check out some of the lectures and information they have. Have you guys heard about the hubbubaloo on Christie's? <laughs> uh, yes. Yes. Yeah, a yeah. little bit. I, I told you guys the, the price of Lunar is on the rise. Well, here's a 33-gram oh, rough cut <laughs> that sold for $380 per gram. Oh. You know, that's 62 grams for $10,000. I, if I had that in my inventory, would be selling for the, the $400 price range. I was researching, and, and I'm glad that uh, we, we brought up irons because I really didn't know a lot about this little meteorite. I had heard rumor that it was used as a doorstop. It says, in 1990, a family from Roundup brought Marlin a 38-pound iron meteorite. The family had been using the unusually heavy rock as a doorstop for a building on their ranch for several years. So the exact date that Roundup was found is 1974. And for 16 years, they used it as a doorstop. Before You're wondering about Tucson? So there were two masses, the Carlton mass and the, the Tucson ring mass. Both of them were used as anvils. So that's kind of an interesting uh, bit of history to them. And uh, I know a lot of people uh, like to see meteorites that fluoresce because there aren't too many of those. So the Tucson ring piece will oftentimes fluoresce, but the Carlton mass will not. Well, first one I'm going to show you is a, a, a Tishomingo. It's an ungrouped iron from Oklahoma. This one is about 130 grams. Yeah, this is a very unusual piece. Um, number one, it's, it's, it's dark gray to black. It, it doesn't have the typical iron. And the, the second thing I like about this is the uh, this little chondral right here, I don't know, or, or inclusion, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know much about this. Uh, I haven't really studied it that much, but it's just a really, really unique iron. I, I was surprised how dark it was. I didn't know if that was a, a lighting artifact. No, but that's, it's, it's, it's actually that dark. Wow. Um, it's it's yeah. one of the highest nickel uh, attack sites known. Yeah, an attack site. Uh, oh, that's sweet. Yeah, it is. One? So Gan Gan, okay, it's, it's from Argentina, plus like Chubut, C-H-U-B-U-T, Argentina. Uh, this piece is 190 grams. It's a fine octahedrite in the IVA group. This is a former Jim Schwade piece. I've had this one so, gosh, I bought this back in uh, 2017. So I've had this about five years. This is a 3.08 gram Welland which uh, fell uh, just south of Toronto back on April 30th of 1888. Small piece was broken off, but the main mass was discarded. When it was found, it was a meteorite. The main mass was again sought out and it was found in a pile of scrap iron inside of an old stove. Oh my God. So uh, the medicine men um, that had looked after this meteorite for generation after generation had prophesied that if the meteorite ever was removed, uh, famine, plague, and war would inflict the uh, Korean Blackfoot of the area. Wow. Oh. Yeah. Wow. That's that's it's a nice end cut. <laughs> <laughs> really shows well, doesn't it? Wow. Yeah, it you see this crack mark here? If you look, it goes all the way through the stone. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but it looks like it's it's following the crystal plane too. So yes, you got to find out the heat right there. It's, it, it's probably weathering along the the uh, crystal plane because uh, Muniana Lustia is a very old meteorite that kind of got dragged around, I guess, under a glacier. Love. We're going to be talking about irons part two today. So these are the subtypes we're going to be discussing. So this chart here shows if you look at the molybdenum ninety four and molybdenum ninety five. Uh, ratios in meteorites that are uh, um, iron meteorites, 
they fall on two trend lines. Uh, and one of them is believed to be non-carbonaceous origin and the others believe to be carbonaceous in origin. Um, so the kind of interesting thing about irons is there really isn't that much oxygen in the majority of them. So O-isotopic really isn't a thing that they use with a lot of the irons. So this is the largest group of irons uh, and there's 333 members in it. One of the interesting things about this group is because of its large size, it makes it really well studied. You know, there's a lot of members, there's a lot of material available. Uh, the other thing that's interesting about this group is it's highly shocked. Uh, the three Fs. Uh, this is a really small group. There's only nine members here. Um, it's medium to coarse octahedrate. Uh, I like to think of this as the U.S. iron group. So mm -hmm. there's only nine members, and six of those nine members were all found in the United States. Wow. What are the uh, odds? Yeah. Oh. So, uh, yeah, there's, there's something going on in the U.S. That, uh, and because those silicates are in there, they kind of can figure out that there's a, a good chance that this parent body got slammed by another parent body and there was mixing of the two materials because the silicates and the iron don't, don't have the same composition. So to give you an idea of how crowded the early solar system was... Uh, you know, you're talking 50 bodies alone right here that were able to be large enough to differentiate and, and hmm. create themselves a core. So I wanted to show off a few pieces of Dranino today. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's Drenino one of the is, best looking ones I've seen. I, I love it when you catch the at the right angle because you have all these little inclusions and all the different colors popping up. Whereas if you look at it straight on, it, it's not. This is a beautiful, beautiful slice, Dernino. Oh, there we go. Uh, oh, a, a bent structure in it too. Yeah. Oh. yeah. This is so unique because it literally has a slice, you know, you can see the slice to it, but it also has the external feature of a sandblasted one. And then the obvious bending of the metal in there. What? Oh, talk about bent things, huh? <laughs> ah. Certainly, yeah. So sticking with the bent theme. So this is a 70 gram piece of Alitai. Uh, so a 3E uh, iron anomalous. Uh, and yeah, exactly the same thing like with your Dronino, you know. Your Dronino obviously took a big heavy hit and so did this Alitai uh, to, to go ahead and bend the pattern structure like that because uh, we talked Gibeon, and Gibeon's got uh, decent availability. It's got a nice structure. Uh, this is actually a piece of the Gibeon anvil. Uh, so oh. we talked about Tucson being an iron that both of the, the members had been uh, used as anvils. Uh, Gibeon was also used as an anvil. And you can see this top surface here. Um, all those little dark marks are actually closed up regmoglyphs um, that have been beaten and pounded flat. Hello, everyone. How are you doing, guys? Hey, yeah, Marco. unfortunately, I'm not the big iron collector, so I don't really have to show any iron meteorites for today's topic. But I had the opportunity to do some astrophotography and I captured a very, I would say, funny object. Yeah, I think most of you guys know the constellation Orion. And Regal is the star that we're looking for. Because Regal illuminates a dust region in constellation of Eridanus and it's exactly that dust region which we will have a closer look and we will have to collect some photons. Yeah guys and the funny object that we're looking for today is the Witch Hat Nebula NGC 2118. As I told you before the Witch Hat Nebula is a reflection nebula so a cosmic dust region where light from the star Regal gets reflected. The Witch Hat Nebula is about 1,000 light years away from Earth. Next week, we are going to be having part three of Carbonaceous. The CBs, the CHs, and the CRs. So the week after that, we're doing a 100% free show and tell. I don't care what it is. If you want to show it off, let's take a look at it. All right, guys, thank you so much for joining us again. Have a great week, and we'll be here again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See you all Bye. later. Bye.